I was recently interviewed by a channel called Coding Conversations. They like to interview a lot of developers and uh, tech business owners and things like that. Uh, I put a link to their channel in the description below. Make sure to uh, click on it, subscribe to the channel. It'll help them out a lot. Uh, and they were kind enough to let me post the, uh, the interview on this channel. So the rest of this video is that interview. I hope you enjoy. Thanks again. If this is your first time, make sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon. We come out with videos all the time. Welcome back to another episode of Code of Conversations. This is Kevin TC, and we have our special guest, TJ McCarty, CEO of uh, Native Notify. How you doing, TJ? Good. Glad to be on uh, the show. Oh, yeah, man. We're definitely glad to have you here. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yeah, so I uh, I have kind of a random uh, story. I I got out of uh, high school not really knowing um, what I wanted to do, and uh, so I I I was uh, really involved in my church growing up, and I liked uh, ministry. So I. The first place I went to was a, a Bible school. I went there for worship leadership. To I like to play the guitar and sing, and um, so I did that first. Uh, I did that for about a year, and then I graduated from a, a Bible school. And then I uh, kind of just wandered around for a few years. I got interested in film, and I uh, went to a film school for a while and uh, worked in film for a little bit, and then. After that, I started. Uh, I got married during that time, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I figured I needed to get a real job and <laughs> that <laughs> can pay the right. bills. Yeah. Um, and so around that time, I I've been starting businesses the whole time, and one of the businesses actually worked out enough where I could like kind of stop everything and go learn how to code from like a coding boot camp. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I took my family uh, to a coding boot camp and uh, in Utah called Dev Mountain, and uh, I learned to code there. And I got a job shortly after. Uh, I've been a full stack. That was about three years ago. I've been a okay. full stack developer since then. Um, and then I started uh, my own company again about a year ago. Uh, I was working part time on it, and then January of this year, I went full time with the business. Okay. Yeah, it's a pretty big transition going from like uh, Bible school to film and then eventually to start your own company. So like, yeah. what, what, what kind of made you want to uh, get into film? So uh, I loved watching movies growing up and uh, I loved acting and I, in plays and things like that. And I was always making funny movies uh, with like mm -hmm. short movies on YouTube and things like that with my brother and friends and so I just thought it'd be really fun. And so I, mm -hmm. that was what got me into it. Um, okay. but I was able to make like around $30,000 a year. Uh, wow. So it wasn't, I didn't make it, I didn't make enough to pay, provide for a family. So that's why I had right. to get out of that. So, so I noticed uh, you said you kind of were like starting businesses all along the way. Uh, what, what gave you that entrepreneurial mindset? So I think it's kind of like in my blood. I uh, my dad was an entrepreneur. Um, I don't know if you know this. Have you ever heard of the, the spiral gumball machine where there's like gum at the top? You can put a quarter mm -hmm. in. It's yeah. Down. So he was the first one to come out with that. Um, oh wow! Product. So he That's sold crazy. that. Yeah, he sold that in thirteen different countries and all the uh, all states of the U.S. Um, and he did that in his 20s and he had, he started uh four multi-million dollar companies in his 20s wow um and uh and he started a fifth one in his 30s and uh so i just grew up around it and so it's mm. just always been i can't help it i i feel like it's almost a sickness cause All right <laughs> uh it's really hard like it's hard to start a company especially uh, one that's successful somehow my dad like back to back to back was able to over a 15 year stretch just 
uh, oh, wow. start companies that were successful. Now, do you do you think that uh, that his first success in the let's let's say after the second one, do you think it just became a habit for him to just build successful companies? Like he just had a formula down. Yeah, I so I personally think what he got really good at is if he could find a pro. He's such a great salesman. Any sales job he's ever had, he's yeah. always gotten to the top of the company, and so. If he could find a product that he could successfully sell that and make like, um, well, if he could find a product he could successfully sell, he could start his own company selling that product. Um, he started out of high school selling vending machines um, mm. with uh, one somebody he had met, and that's sort of how he got into. Uh, he started with like candy machines, then Coke machines, and then somebody he knew uh, show, wanted to show him his his Viper car. It's I think they don't make them anymore, but he wanted to show him his Viper. And while he was at the guy's house, he turned and saw the spiral, the first ever spiral gumball machine in that guy's garage. He's mm -hmm. like, what is that? And he's like, oh, that's just something I threw together. It's not, I only got like a few of them, but he's like, Tell me about that. I want to. I can sell that. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, he that one became so big. Uh, he went from like zero to over a million dollars a month in revenue in like um, fourteen months. And wow. Um, wow, it was just one of the. It was a hit. It was like uh, he was able to sell it for like three thousand dollars a machine too. And um, that's kind of a big deal. Like it's a lot of vending machines are like under a thousand dollars. He was able to successfully sell it for $3,000. And uh, so there's like a lot of room in there to hire salespeople and still have some profit. Mm -hmm. left over. So, so did he have the patent to that? Like the, the whole design and uh, because I, I like uh, growing up, I remember seeing those type of machines, but they didn't always have gumballs. They had like toys and some other type of stuff inside of it as well. Right. Yeah, sometimes they do that. Um, he, his friend was the one who owned the patent. He got yeah. the rights to sell sell it. So his okay. company was the first to sell it, and uh, he got them every, like everywhere. Um, but yeah, as far as a, a habit from there, it was just in him. It's always been in him. Um, he he started from nineteen. He convinced some investor to let him flip houses for him and. Uh, so he's just always been a hustler. Since he was in sixth grade, he's like had his own business. So, mm. um, his first company, he uh, he sold cinnamon toothpicks. Like he want the first time he realized he could make money was he wanted a dirt bike from his. He asked his dad to buy him one. He's like, I'm not gonna buy you one, but you, if you saved up the money and made the money, you could buy one. So that was the first time we thought about how could I make money? And yeah. uh, he just threw together, he heard of cinnamon toothpicks. He woke up early in the morning. He borrowed some money from his sister who was older, uh, woke up early in the morning and would put together cinnamon toothpicks. And then he would uh, go sell them for a quarter each at his school. And uh, he got enough to buy his the $200 dirt bike and a helmet too. So. Anyway, but he's been doing businesses ever since. So. Did uh, your dad like intentionally expose you to the business? Like, was he trying to kind of raise an entrepreneurial spirit? Yeah, he he did. Uh, he, it, and it was just a natural thing. It was just a part of our lives. So uh, mm -hmm. I was naturally around it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And he ended up writing a book. Um, that hasn't come out yet but it might be coming out soon but uh i read the book and it had a big impact on me um and it's basically in business well in the bible it there's a difference between riches and wealth if you read mm -hmm. scriptures about riches it's like stuff like nice things um yeah. whereas wealth is like an income producing asset of some mm -hmm. kind some sort of thing that generates ongoing revenue, like land. It talks to, like farmland in the Bible is like wealth because it constantly mm -hmm. generating revenue. So he's, his whole point is like uh, 
he had to learn a lot of this the hard way, but uh, you right. really should be focused on, if you're wanting to start a business, focus on generating wealth. So you should be trying to start businesses that can generate ongoing revenue, not just like single sales and then they're gone. Mm. Yeah. To make, create some sort of product where maybe they'll pay monthly or yearly for the service or something like that. So, and that's part of what got me to think Native Notify could be a good business idea because I can, it can be a monthly mm -hmm. revenue business. So, so like, uh, oh, go ahead, Terrence. Yeah, so what were some of the uh, bigger lessons that he taught you that you still use today? So uh, that focus on the income producing asset, that's like a huge thing. Um, mm -hmm. it, like it's a massive, so like uh, for him, it, when he first got out and started flipping houses, he got addicted to flipping houses, like buying a house, flipping it, making ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 right away at 19. He's like loving that. Well, along the way, he also bought up some apartments that were generating like a solid three to five thousand dollars a month in revenue. Mm. Uh, but that wasn't exciting to him. He loved the flipping. And so like uh, there ended up being a down market, like all mm -hmm. the prices started dropping. And like he had all these houses that he just couldn't sell. What he mm. should have done is he should have gotten rid of the houses that he wanted to flip and keep the apartments because that was continuing to generate revenue but he did the opposite he just got rid of the apartments and uh kept oh. the houses and then he lo lost everything you know losing mm. um and so he kind of went through that over and over and over again through his 20s all his businesses um it's like there was a a time they were all like one-time hit businesses like even mm. the spiral gumball machine like if he could have gone back one of the things he may have done differently is he should have started a gumball manufacturing plant and say if you buy my machine you've got to be buying the gumballs from us or something like mm -hmm. that so he could be making money off the gumballs today still but instead the he basically sold it everywhere you possibly could sell it and then people just stopped buying it and that company went under and he did that with a toy company and then uh, which the toy company was actually kind of successful, but, but, but it took some time for him to learn that. So for me, uh, that's a huge lesson. I always, mm -hmm. is I don't even want to waste my time trying to start a company where it's like, I'm selling maybe a product where they buy it once and you just, you're hopeful that they'll buy it again. Always like, don't even, I don't even waste my time with that. I always mm -hmm. try to start a company where I can make, a monthly or a yearly recurring revenue stream because that's that's wealth that's something that once you build it up to a point it'll last and um so that's that's always been a huge one of the biggest things i've learned from them so yes yeah, so, so uh can you tell me a little bit about was it native notify or notify native i, I forget what <laughs> Yeah, it's native notify.com. So uh, I started that. I can't believe it's almost, it was like a year ago, uh, August of last year is when it went live and it looks so bad. <laughs> it's <just> so embarrassing <laughs> how bad it looked. But uh, I literally, um, so I was building an app for a client that I was working with uh, using the Expo framework, which is built on top of React Native. Um, and I was surprised to find I could not find a push notification service on the market for the Expo framework specifically. Um, all the services I found made you do what's called eject out of Expo um, to basically get out of Expo and be just using React Native again. Um, yeah. So what made so anyway? I just ended up building one myself, so users can stay inside of Expo. They don't have to leave Expo. Um, it's called Managed Workflow, um, and I just went live with that to see if I could get any paying customers, and I I got enough traction uh, by January to where I felt comfortable quitting my job and just mm. focusing on it full time. And um, it's been growing slowly, uh, but steady, but slowly, but um, it's been the the revenue's been been growing pretty well, but um, it's one of those things. It's like 
man, I was just thinking the other day, like, uh, man, you'll never value a, even like a $50,000 a year job more than mm. if you try to start a, a business that's yeah. profitable enough to be able to pay somebody $50,000 a year. Like it's yeah. hard, like it's very yeah. hard to <laughs> just get any winner at all. You can be like trying for 20 years. And uh, that's why I was like, I feel like it's almost like a disease a little bit. Cause if you're a good developer, you can make six figures mm. and have a comfortable job. Um, but it's like, if there's this drive in you to start something, it's like, you can't help yourself. and you just keep starting things until something finally works out and it's and it's it's like when something actually does work out then you're especially hooked like okay something worked out one time i i can just i just i just keep trying and trying and trying eventually something's gonna work out um but it's not easy you definitely it takes a lot of dedication and hard work and just faith like you have to have so much right. faith Okay. Yeah. This can be something. This can work one day. Uh, exactly. So. Uh, did, did you start it by yourself or did you have like a small team? Okay. I started it by myself. So I had a super basic just expo push notification service um, just to see. I had a minimum viable product just to see if I could get any users at all. Um, and I figured out how to, how to get users and um, I expanded. I created a lot more services, specific messaging services for the Expo framework. Uh, then I, uh, when I went full time, I wanted to see if I could uh, expand outside of just Expo. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I went ahead and built a Flutter solution um, okay. for the Flutter language and also just traditional React Native. Um, I So now I have a solution for React Native, Expo, and uh, Flutter. And um, there's a lot of additional features I've added to each of those languages. And right now I'm working to expand into web push notifications, Android native push notifications, and iOS native push notifications. Um, with those five languages, I, I'm estimating I'm around 90% of the market of developers mm. in push notifications. And so, uh, but yeah, it's just all been me uh, and doing everything. <laughs> so, designing everything, building everything, marketing everything. Uh, I've been mainly focused on YouTube. Uh, that's mm -hmm. where I get most of my users. So that, and I've been on YouTube in the past. And so that's what I've kind of comfortable with. So. So is uh, YouTube where you got like most of your customers or. Yeah, it is. Uh, our, my Google search engine optimization efforts is just now starting to pay out pay off mm. a bit. Um, so I am starting to get some from Google too, but by far most of the results have been from YouTube, um, which is I, something interesting is like YouTube is a huge blind spot for a lot of tech companies I've mm. found. It's like a lot of tech companies act like it doesn't even exist, uh, but it's like the second largest search engine in the world. And um, yep. you, can get, you can get a lot of good results and traction and you can be building a community along the way too mm -hmm. so um that's that i don't have like i don't know any investors or anything like that like i i, I wish i was one of those people who be like i have an idea i just raised one to five million dollars yeah <laughs> but no i like had to bootstrap everything and uh so i anyway i just i uh tried out google ads first they're so expensive and um, mm. in this market, but YouTube is very reasonable. And so like, um, I've actually been able to uh, create, I got about 3,200 subscribers now on YouTube and uh, the community's building there. And uh, the thought is like, if I ever run out, run out of money, I'll at least have my subscribers on YouTube. I can keep marketing to organically. Mm -hmm. um, so. I won't have nothing in the end. So it's another one of those, in my mind, the wealth versus riches thing. Like if you're focused on Google ads, you're focused mm -hmm. on like one time hits, okay. um, if you're focused on building a community on like YouTube or Facebook or 
anywhere else, LinkedIn, something mm. like that. Uh, all your marketing efforts have the added benefit of creating a community of followers that might buy your products in the future. So I've officially, I'm almost like, I have very, very tiny little bit into Google ads, um, but the vast majority is just directed towards YouTube because uh, I feel like it's a has the long-term benefit of building a community that um, can generate additional revenue in the future. Do you, so, uh, uh, I'll go ahead. No. <laughs> uh, it was just a quick, a quick question. Um, so let, let's, where do you see your service going after you've capitalized 90% of the market? Because I'm, I'm trying to think of like, with with normal SaaS, right, software as a service, right, you you can you can you have a platform, it, it covers a certain market, and you can add features onto it. But then, with notifications, how far do you how far do you see your platform going? Like, so one of the good things about no, push notifications is um, it's such an essential service for um, app developers specifically. So it's like um, there's around like 25 million app developers in the world and it's yeah. still growing like about 17 percent a year um and so like uh i could if it really took off one day i mean they could have millions of users um yeah. and i'm i'm wanting to eventually expand outside of just push notifications to maybe have like build a chat bubble for uh, a lot of our users or e-commerce users and uh, just other essential messaging solutions that might be valuable to like e-commerce app type apps and stuff like that. And um, just ex focus first on building out some imp some basic push notification services. And then I have, like I start out with like a push notification service where you can send notifications to all your users at once. And mm -hmm. then I'll add in the future where it makes it real simple to send it to individual users. Um, so like one user at a time, um, and then yeah. like groups of users. And so like each one of those takes time okay. to build out. And so yeah. Yeah. that's, I, that's kind of cool. that's the, where it's heading. Yeah. So, okay, cool. I'm interested in seeing where, where that, where that's going to go. Yeah. Cause it sounds like you're, you're building out, there's a service called Clavio. Um, and now you're talking about, they do something similar where they have, you can, um, you can build campaigns essentially. And so you have these users and these users are segmented by certain attributes um, depending on like the life, like not the lifetime, what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, when the user signed up for your mailing list or whatever, and like uh, the different uh, attributes like purchase uh, types and stuff like that in the past. Um, uh, yeah, and so you can really drill down to like a, a really like really pinpoint the user that you want to target and send that push notification to or email to. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like that's, that's the direction, that's the direction that you're thinking about going instead yeah. of just emailing everybody at once. Yeah, that is a, that is a specific future goal of ours that, I, that, I, that I've had is I would like to eventually have an automated uh, service where you can kind of maybe like even an AI powered one where they, it can keep track of users buying patterns and, um, and then send specific notifications to individuals based on what they bought in the past. And yeah. Stuff like that. So, okay. Yeah, a lot of different things I'd love to do. And, uh, so I'm hoping basically my goal right now is I'm hoping I could get to the point where I get enough traction to where investors would be interested in, in investing in the company. Um, but until then, I'll just be bootstrapping. And uh, that's something I've learned too. Like, uh, if you want to start a business, just don't, just count on not being able to raise money. <laughs> like, <laughs> just expect to have to build something and create traction all on your own. Uh, yeah. Even if it doesn't seem fair, it's just the way it is. And it's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. You just, and if you think about it, like, especially as a developer, you can make a decent income and it's so mm -hmm. easy to create a minimum viable product as a developer, like a full stack developer that yeah. um, maybe it's kind of reasonable for investors to expect you to have something up there with some users before they'll even think about uh, investing. Um, but it's just one of those things you have to be determined to do it. And 
Uh, so, but yeah, that's the the goal right now. Since you don't have any uh, fixed income coming in, you have to like be very careful about how you spend your money. Yes, yeah, and so that's that's another thing. Um, it's kind of, I think it can kind of be an advantage um, because I, I heard the one of the guys on Shark Tank. Uh, he said he has a theory that uh, money makes you stupid, and like people with a lot of money have just blow money uh, mm. without even thinking about it uh, and start trying to start a startup. Whereas somebody that is just bootstrapping, like will really think about, will this actually generate any results? And uh, once they start spending the money, they'll actually be tracking, is this actually generating results or not? Uh, and it does cause you to really, uh, focus on revenue, you actually have to generate revenue or you will die. Mm -hmm. You can't just have like millions of dollars investors in the bank that you can just uh, be going like, like I've come in contact with people who have, have raised millions of dollars and they'll go like years without going live with a product or generating any revenue. And um, when they do go live with the product, they're, they're surprised that uh, they're, you people don't use their product. Uh, they maybe they spent two years building something that nobody wants. <laughs> um, I listened to advice from a comp a, an accelerator called Y Combinator. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys have ever heard of them, but mm -hmm. one of the things is uh, they invested in companies like Airbnb and Dropbox and people like Stripe, stuff like that. Um, well, one of their big things is just uh, go live as fast as humanly possible. Uh, and there's a useful lie that you think you're going to build something that people want, uh, but then you're going to go live and realize it's not what people want. And you're going to have to talk to your users and build what they want. <laughs> um, but you just, they're like, you should think in terms of weeks, not months or years. Like, you should be live with something in like six weeks. Like it needs to just get yeah. some, you should be embarrassed of what you put up there. Uh, but if it's that, if it actually solves a real problem, then people yeah. will use it anyway. And um, so that's the advice I followed. I put something up that looks so bad, uh, but it was just, it was a real need because there wasn't another solution out there. Um, so people use my service and then, Everybody, my users politely would say, hey, would you like me to help with uh, your design? I can just <laughs> help redesign your website. I'm like, it's okay. But I finally, like after a few months of that, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take some time to make it look decent. And so I made it look better at that point. But up to then I was just talking to them about the features they wanted and would add in the features that they asked for until it became something that a, a good bit of people liked. So loved like that's another thing uh they say instead of trying to build something a lot of people just like a little bit try to focus on making something a hundred people love absolutely love yeah um, and if you can do that the odds are it'll be a lot easier to expand from there to to scale to get a lot more users so um they say start on a really simple problem that is a real problem uh get it live, try to get some users, track their usage rates, uh, and just talk to them until, ask them what they want until you have something at least 100 people love, and then um, you can build from there. Um, so um, I don't know what the point of all that was. I just <laughs> now, but. Yeah. but you, you gotta, you, you're on the, you gotta write the right mindset. It's like you have to focus on uh, a part of a, get your product out there as soon as possible right don't 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 let it marinate don't think don't like stew on it for months and months thinking that you're building something awesome and then when you put it out there you know let's say 20 percent of it everybody likes and then the other 80 percent that you thought that everybody was gonna like they they don't they, it doesn't click with users right and then yeah. you're like oh well i wasted all this time debbing out all this other stuff now i have to either scrap it or you know uh you don't know 
feature flag it or whatever you whatever have you um just yeah. get a minimum product out there and then users are going to request like hey it'd be cool if i could do this or hey it'd be cool if i could do that or have you ever thought about doing this yeah right and it just organically happens so like the the one thing i did right when i went live with just all you could do is uh send push notifications to all your users. That's literally yeah. all you can do um, within Expo. And um, yeah. I put a little question mark on every page that if you clicked on, you could see my email address. And uh, I would just say, if you have any questions or thoughts at all, just email me, yeah. uh, I'll directly respond within a day. Um, and people, users would just start reaching out, asking for specific things. Like one of the first requests was, can you have a way, a receipt uh, feature where I can see how many people are actually receiving my push notifications or not? Um, and so I, that was one of the first things I built. Another one was I would like to send push notifications to individuals, not just everybody. Uh, and then it just went on and on from there. Um, and another great thing about building a community, focusing on building a community, with your marketing, like on YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that, is uh, in the comment section, whenever you post a video, they can immediately say how they, you can ask in the video, be like, can you please, I, we really value your opinion, please let us know in the comments. Uh, if you like it, what you would change about it, uh, we really wanna know, we, we value your opinion, we wanna build what you want. Um, yeah. And so if you focus on just one small feature that is a real need, get it out there, the, they'll just organically reach out to you and um, ask for, for new features. And you can just build exactly what they want. And instead of wasting six months, a year, two years, three years, trying to build everything you think everyone would want, and it's like just gigantic waste of time and uh, that's one of the dangers of having like millions of dollars in the bank. You like you mm -hmm. can you can actually go three years building something without any revenue, <laughs> uh, no users yeah. thinking that uh, you're doing a good job, and then you go live and you find out, oh my gosh, nobody likes my product. <laughs> what did I do? And so like you can if you're bootstrapped, uh, you can kind of jump ahead of the competition, even if they have millions of dollars in the bank, you can still beat them just by going live and actually talking to users and actually building what they really want, mm. just what you think they want. Yeah. So, so like uh, you said, like YouTube was extremely important in terms of marketing, uh, but how do you grow your YouTube? What are some of your strategies you use there? Uh, so there's some strategies, some uh, is just whenever you're, uh, searching for terms in on YouTube, you'll notice like it'll pop down underneath mm -hmm. what people are specifically searching. So if you specifically title your uh, videos based on the top results and the search mm -hmm. results, uh, it's it's a lot easier to get to the top of results on YouTube than it is on like Google. Um, you Like Google, it's almost like they don't value your the title at all unless you have all these uh, sites linking to it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, 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 a lot of times, if there's not a video with the exact title, um, it'll sometimes appear in the first five results right away. Like, um, and uh, so that's one way. And uh, constantly, there's a way you can uh, um, link back and forth between your videos. So uh, constantly in your videos, mention. And uh, I talk more about this in this video. So if you'd like to check it out, you can check out this video right here. Mm -hmm. um, and then asking users to subscribe and uh, like, because if people subscribe, like, comment, it'll, the YouTube algorithms will like the video more and show it higher up. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, so those are some, some tips. And do you, uh, when you release new features, do you send out a push notification to users when you release a new feature or do you release a new video? So I just release a new video. I, I should, I sometimes will release an email to all the users because um, I collect their email when they sign up. 
Um, but I, that's one of the things I should do better about, but I, I really, I'm just like, I feel like I'm keeping my head above water all the time. And so like, I'll just, I just throw up another video on YouTube and, uh, let them know that way. And, um, and anytime there's a new feature too, in the, the, on the website, I'll have like a little tag that says new, um, like mm -hmm. on the sidebar or something like that. So they'll know to click and see that there's a new feature. Um, so that's another thing I'll do. Another thing that I want to do, like my next notification feature I'm building is a web push notification service. And uh, I want to add that to nativenotify.com too, so I can just send notifications uh, that way. And um, I've created another feature called a notification inbox, which is sort of like a, you know how like on Facebook or LinkedIn, there's like a notification bell. Um, basically I'm built, I've got that for expo, um, where you can have a bell that you could click on and see the notification sent. So I should add that to native notify. I just haven't done that yet, but that's something I need to do that I've heard is a really good idea to add some sort of thing. So users know, wow, I'm, they're creating new stuff all the time. Um, so, but they will notice, like if you build a community, I have uh, users have re just in the comments said, wow, you're a hard worker. Um, they just, lots of users have actually just said that because they can see, yeah. wow, he's pumping out new stuff all the time. Uh, uh, do you ever see, well, let me, how do I, let me think about the time I ask this question. Um, well, this is, this is mostly for like open source software, but uh, I'm going to try and tw uh, twist it for this uh this scenario so let's say like you build a platform you build a service um do you ever see yourself sort of uh letting it go i guess you could say like one day you're just like I'm, i don't want to do this anymore i'm just gonna let it just become antiquated you know expo releases something else or, or react native releases a new version and it breaks the service and you or you say uh, at the end of 2024 um this service is going away mm -hmm. and just letting it do its thing do you ever see yourself sort of letting it go uh i don't personally with native notify currently because it's it's actually at the point to where it could be default alive uh revenue wise so um yeah. i may would have to get a job one day uh but it could always it the way it's designed to um it's designed to exist without me. So like mm -hmm. I could stop working on it completely and it would still work. It would still be generating revenue. It would still mm -hmm. get new users. Um, and so that's a big thing too, that uh, my dad taught me too, is you you don't want to build yourself a job. Uh, basically, if you're building yourself a job, like a business where you have to be there, um, yeah. that's not a real business. You're, you're starting a job, you're creating a job for yourself. You want to eventually build a business where it can live without you. Um, that's, that's the ultimate goal. So that's one of the great things about software based products is um, it can live without you if you just design it that way to, to run on its own without you having to do anything long term. Yeah. So yeah, I know there's like immense complexity with you being uh, the sole entrepreneur. How do you manage all of that complexity? You have to do the marketing, programming, et cetera. So uh, I honestly think it may be God just helped uh, over the past 12 years since I got out of high school. I literally just kind of randomly just pursued different interests. And those interests just all happen to be great to know to build like tech a tech company. Um, so like I just would just randomly on my own, I'd make YouTube videos with friends mm. and stuff like that, start a YouTube channel. Uh, I'd randomly get into film, um, randomly would start website based business. I'd come out with a product that I'd want to sell, uh, try to sell it online. And so then I'd have to learn marketing to know how to sell that. Cause I don't know anybody, uh, with money or anything, any investors or anything like that. Um, so I would just kind of have to find, figure it all out on my own. I would just do it on the side. And uh, a book actually that helped me a lot 
it's called the four hour work week. I don't know if you've heard of that book before, but it kind of gives you a, a process for thinking of ideas and uh, how to market those ideas. And so I read that book too. That had a huge impact on me too. And uh, that gave you a process for starting new companies. And one of the big things in that book is it's, it's all against the whole, it's really the launch fast concept. It's like, mm -hmm. It teaches you don't spend any time building until you verify that people actually want what you have to sell. And so like his way, his name's Timothy Ferris. Um, his way to, uh, he says, suggests you do that is put up a, a, a website with the product you want to sell, even if you haven't sold it yet, with like mm -hmm. a buy now button. And when they click the buy now button, say, sorry uh we're still working on getting this product live but we'll get back to you uh when it is live you can give us your email right here though uh, and we'll email you when the product's live or something like that mm -hmm. um, and then you can just track how many times users click the buy now button and how much money you spent um on ads on like google ads and things like that um and then that can let you know okay i can expect if I spend this much, I can expect to get this many sales from this product because this many people click the buy now button. And so then only then do you go on to build the product. Um, uh, so I did that a, a few times. I personally, though, I've updated it a little bit. I hate the idea of like wasting money on ads without a product live. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll always try to have some minimum bio problem viable product that I could sell right away. And so that I can just go ahead and test out uh, if they want to buy it um, right away. But that doesn't work for every product. Like a lot of products are a lot more complicated, but uh, you'd be surprised. Like the first business I had that actually kind of worked out, it was a good side income. It was called Laptop for Riders. I uh, was mm -hmm. a, writing books at the time and I wanted a, I heard a lot of authors saying they're so distracted by social media that they, they only have like an hour to write uh, in the mornings before work, but they end up checking their social media during that hour. And so they don't end up ever finishing a book. And so my thought was, what if I created a, a computer where it's literally impossible to uh, log on to social media while you're writing your book? Mm. Uh, I'm thinking of this grand product, but I'm just thinking I could, couldn't do that right now. So I literally just, uh, I went ahead and put up some ads and said I could just figure it out if, if anybody bought it. And uh, so I put up ads and I, I priced the uh, product at like $299. Oh, wow. As if it was real. And uh, I actually got some sales. <laughs> and uh, I I just figured, oh my gosh, so I just ran to Walmart and I put, I just got some laptops and um, I uh, I just set parental guide locks on the laptops that, uh, <laughs> and that made it to where you can't browse the internet. And then I sent it to them with their password to get in and they loved it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So like even a hardware product, I was able to figure out how to get something, you know, yeah. uh, and so that never really generated enough income to be a full time income or anything. But I sold like one to three laptops a month, basically for a couple of years. Uh, and then I moved on to other things. But. Hey, uh, Yannick, uh, do you have any questions for TJ? Hey, TJ. Yeah, hey. I, I actually have a couple. Um, so um, as far as I know, I missed the tech stock, the tech stack portion. Um, can you tell me about the tech stack, uh, what you used to uh, build the whole platform? Yeah, so for Native Notify, I, uh, it, I started out using React Native Expo because you can use that language to build a website and an Android and iOS app all in one. So you write the code once uh, and then it can become everything. Uh, but as I was developing it, um, I realized uh, there was like, it's better to kind of use React for a website and Expo just for the, the apps because of some styling related things. 
Uh, and so I just started developing it as if it was a React website, and it's it's almost like a bit of a mess. I wish I would have just started with React, uh, but everything works fine and it works great. And one day I plan on going back and just making it all React. But yeah, I use uh, React uh, Expo, um, Node.js on the back end, uh, and Postgres uh, as my database. Uh, so that's what I use for that. Um, I've used a lot of other tech over the years too, but that's that's what I use for uh, native Notify. Yeah, I haven't um, actually just had like my first exposure to React, and, and, I, and I like it. It's pretty cool. I'm uh, I'm more familiar with Angular, but uh, React React's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I so I know you're like doing all of this by yourself right now. Like, at what point do you think? that you will start, you know, building a team out. I mean, maybe it's when you get funding or, or maybe when, you know, traffic becomes, you know, grows to a certain level, but you can't, you can't do it all by yourself forever. Right. So at what point do you think you'll be able to like build out a team around this? So when it, yeah, the, my goal is to get enough traction to get investors interested in the company. Uh, once I raise enough money, I have talked to some developers that I trust that I've worked with in the past that there's one in particular that made it sound like he would actually come on board. Uh, and there's, there's two others, um, that I know are good developers that I would want to bring on board too. Uh, I would love to do that right now. If I could, I just, I don't have any investors. I've just been, uh, bootstrapping and, uh, it's like it's so hard for me to even try to take the time like to devote like a few months or something to raise money or something like that when i'm just thinking gosh i could build so much in a few months <laughs> like i might as well just spend those few months building stuff and uh but eventually i'm gonna have to stop and just actually talk to investors but um even though i don't really know how to do that i don't know anybody so but uh i but anyway, yeah, I'm uh, eventually I will have to do that. Like, I already, if I had a team, I could do so much more, so much faster. Um, but I'm hoping um, I, I should in the next six months have uh, the, the basic push notification services that I want to have finished, finished. And hopefully there should be enough traction at that point to devote some time to trying to raise some money at that point. And uh, so that's hopefully six months or so I can start raising some money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you seem, you seem quite like you seem very entrepreneurial. I mean, you have, you probably had a few businesses that failed uh, yes. on the way here. Um, so have you ever, have you ever considered uh, those uh, like startup accelerators? Have you ever considered doing something like that? Yes. I, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Y Combinator. So I apply to them every batch. <laughs> so I've been applying to them every batch for like a couple of years now. Um, and I actually got an interview <laughs> like mm -hmm. uh, two batches ago, um, which apparently only like the top 5% of applicants get an interview. So, wow. Uh, and if you get an interview, there's like a one out of four chance you'll get in. Uh, so I didn't get in. But, um, but I'm still, my traction today is looks way better than what it did uh, two batches ago, which is like almost a year ago now that I did apply there. Um, so I'm hopeful I can get into that. Basically, my that's like the one thing I've been just trying to get into. And then I've just been focusing on uh, making my company better, uh, increasing, increasing user count, retention rate, revenue. Um, and I'm hopeful that eventually they'll just want to let me in because uh, I know by far that would be the best organization to get into. And, uh, and I'd have to just start all over trying to get into other, but yes, I I've tried to get into them. I've, they're the most responsive too. It's like, I've tried other accelerators too, but, um, a lot of times they don't even respond and, uh, they don't give any details. And so, but yeah, I have tried. I think accelerators are a good starting point, especially if you don't know anybody. 
because they make it so easy to just apply. Anybody can apply. Um, and I have actually gotten a response from Y Combinator, like an interview. Um, so I do think that's a great starting point for entrepreneurs that don't know anybody. But you should expect to have to create something and get a decent amount of traction before they'll even want to interview, most likely. So. So do you ever have anybody in the community reach out and try to help you? Because uh, like with this podcast, a lot of the people that come on, they've actually, they're actually from the community. They've watched the episode and say, hey, we want to help you out. Uh, I have had some of my users reach out to uh, see if, if I uh, would like some help with the design specifically. That was mm -hmm. back when everything looked so bad. Um, but since I made everything look decent, I haven't had too many anybody really re reach out from that point but um yeah i i i could definitely do more with with some help for sure uh i have a have specific plans of what i i would like to accomplish but, um, like would you be open to kind of like uh mentoring uh, junior developers say hey i want to work for you um you know, you don't have to pay me. I just look at this as a kind of internship. Like, would you be kind of open to mentoring that developer? Yeah, actually, I mean, I if if you are looking for an internship, I I could actually use the help <laughs> a lot. Uh, and yes. if you do know React, uh, Node.js, Postgres, any of those, um, I could actually get you up to speed and. That actually could, I could use that actually. <laughs> I think about myself, when I got out of coding boot camp um, out of Dev Mountain, there's like a six month, it took me about six months to find a job. So mm -hmm. uh, I, if you are a developer listening right now and you just got out of a coding boot camp and you think maybe you'll get a job right away, but there's a good chance it could take six months to a year before you could get a job. And if you do have an internship on your resume, without a gap in your resume, you are a lot more likely to actually get a job. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. if you did help me, you would get very valuable information. You'd be building complicated things. So I've never thought of that, actually. It's, that's a good idea. Maybe that. Maybe someone will reach out. So. <laughs> Terrence, wasn't the internship like key for you getting your uh, current job? Uh, yeah, yeah, honestly. Um, uh, so I was sort of like, uh, working full time and I had like a small internship, uh, at, uh, as, uh, outside of work that I was working on and they taught me like react and GraphQL and a bunch of other, like super cutting edge type of tech, but it was, it was tough. It was tough juggling in both. Um, but yeah, like after like six to eight months, like I finally like, uh, got a got a this new gig that i'm at now and um it was really helpful like looking at their code i just i cracked open the code base now uh at my current job and it's pretty similar to what i've been doing for the past like eight months and like I, i'm blessed to say like like that fear of like going from uh a coding boot camp or like going from like working on a pet project or something into like actual professional work uh it's almost as if I was just doing professional work for the past six months and I didn't even know it, you know? So, um, yeah, internships are like super, super handy if they're teaching the right stuff, like the, that, that's it can carry over into like the professional uh, world. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. So like, uh, you know, I know faith is a really strong part of who you are. Um, like, how do you maintain your faith, you know, especially with the way the world is going? Yeah, so um, one of the things I just decided to do uh, on LinkedIn was just be very open about my faith, that I'm a Christian. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just uh, over the past couple of years, you know, it's, just, it's like the world has become so wicked and um I feel like I feel like courage is contagious, mm -hmm. and uh, it just takes a few 
people willing to just be kind and open about their faith and just be like, and I've been surprised. I've seen like on LinkedIn, a lot of people are just being coming out, being open about their faith and, um, mm -hmm. and being kind about it and not, uh, and I think it, it's, it's such a positive, good thing for the world. Like, uh, I, I personally love LinkedIn in that, like, it's, it's such a positive place compared to, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think because, you know, employers could be looking at everything you post, it causes you to be restrained and you don't want to sound like a crazy person, uh, on there. So like it, it helped me personally a lot. Like I would have a tendency sometimes to sound a little bit like a crazy person on like Facebook or something like that. I had to stop myself. Like I had to just, cause like the world wants to draw you into all the drama and I just mm -hmm. get up. But with LinkedIn, I, it's just been a lot easier to just share thoughts on, um, like, uh, just business thoughts. And then just also just share scriptures every once in a while. And, uh, just be open and um, and I've noticed it does it does have an effect on other people people others will start sharing their faith and be more open mm. and um, and uh, so yeah it is it is the most important part of my life I love Jesus with all my heart and uh, I I would be lost without him I I tried to live life without him for a little bit and it was awful it was terrible and uh, and so uh, he's so important, like nothing else matters. And um, I, I don't know where I'd be today without him. And uh, I don't, I, I was reading in the Bible recently in Second uh, Corinthians, uh, I think it's chapter five on how, um, you know, part of why we should share our faith and be open is um, just fear of the Lord. The Bible says one day we're gonna stand in that passage, chapter four and five, one mm -hmm. day we're gonna stand before Christ and give an account of all our, works that we did um whether good or bad and he said uh, uh those of us who have been saved we who have put their trust in jesus we should uh be, because of the fear of the lord we should be uh compelled to share our faith with others um because mm -hmm. one day you're gonna have to stand before christ and you're gonna have to tell him because uh, as a christian you believe there's only two places that you can go either heaven or right. hell. Mm -hmm. uh, you should out of love it talks about being controlled by the love of christ you should not want people to go to hell you should want people to go to heaven and jesus yeah. ask you did you did you try to save anybody did you try to make sure anybody went to heaven and uh so did you fulfill my great the great commission and so so yeah that's yeah it is a big part of my life and uh, i i love jesus i love sharing my faith i uh, i share my faith all throughout mm -hmm. my life and he's always he's blessed me since i've really been uh devoted to him before i was devoted to him i i was broke and <laughs> so that God, god's really blessed me and uh and uh so so do you feel like uh once you like got into your faith the blessings started to flow like doors started to open yes for sure um and uh it came from so like once i devoted my life to christ i uh about a year later i found my wife um and mm. uh, we loved the lord and um after that i forgot to mention i became a youth pastor for about a year after that um but yeah th that door opened uh, before then i so uh i became a youth pastor i um the after that, uh, there was like a rough patch financially, uh, but uh, I stayed faithful to Christ and eventually one of those businesses worked out and uh, I was able to take uh, the little bit I had and, and learn to code, thinking that that could be a good career. Mm -hmm. place. And uh, yeah, and since then God's, God's really blessed us and uh, I've been grateful for everything and um so yeah i do feel like that i do think too like one of the things is like um he didn't allow that to happen until i had like the love of the world more out of me mm -hmm. um so like it's 
the Bible says the love of money is the root of of all evil. It doesn't say money. It does say the love of money. But like right. if you have the love of the pride of life, the lust of the eyes and the flesh of of life, then um, God might not want to bless you because he loves you and he doesn't want mm. you to fall into sin. But uh, if you truly get to the point where he's the center of your life, uh, I think he it is just a natural thing. He does want to bless his children um, as long as he that doesn't cause them to to worship money or right old or anything he, but he does like to bless his his children yeah i think god definitely gives us the blessings when we're ready for it and not before because you know sometimes that material wealth that can take us in the wrong direction yeah so like how do you how do you stay like centered and not get drawn out you know drawn off by the money and the other things so a uh, big thing is make sure to read my Bible every day. And uh, I read my Bible with my family uh, almost every day now. Um, and uh, always be going to church each week. Um, a huge thing since um, I, I the job I got ended up being in Florida. And um, it's in this tiny town in Florida, I never would have expected to live here. But uh, gosh, there's this church where... Um, the spirit is just it it's he's so present at that church like, mm -hmm. every week and uh that has been such a huge part of my life just actually finding a church where um the bible talks about don't quench the holy spirit and uh it's so refreshing to go to a place where the holy spirit is allowed to uh to to be free and and it's not just a form of godliness. It has power. And so that's a big part of uh, mm. And They've really just a good church that there's a lot of churches out there that like um, they do. Uh, it, it, there is a lot of love of the world in the church and they make it seem like a Christian life is a good Christian life is one where you have lots of money and lots of worldly happiness. Um, mm -hmm. but like our pastor, a couple weeks ago was just talking about how you know in the old testament when uh god saved the israelites from from egypt he had them uh bring offerings uh to uh moses and it wasn't so that he could give them back a bunch of stuff worldly stuff it was so that he could build they could build a temple and he said i'll put my presence there i'll be there with you in the midst mm -hmm. in the midst of you and uh and so uh, so in, just finding a good church that truly values, loves Jesus and, uh, wants you to draw closer to, to God and, um, not isn't a church that's putting the love of the world in you, but is putting the love of Jesus in you. And that's such a huge, huge, huge thing, because if you're weekly going to a family of believers where you're being encouraged to obey Christ and, uh, share your faith with others and um, love love God and don't love this world. Um, mm -hmm. that, that is such a huge, huge thing. So. so it sounds like community has like a very huge effect, a very huge influence on like even your thinking and, you know, yeah. just how you feel every day. Yes, it does. Yeah, it is really, it's so important. It's a, uh, and the, the right kind of church in Hebrews, it talks about uh, don't neglect the gathering together of the saints. It talks about make sure you're gathering together to encourage one another to mm. good works and to obey Christ. And so that's the right kind of church you, to seek out is one that's always pushing you, that you can get friends who are pushing you to stay on the narrow path because the, mm -hmm. the Bible says if only a few find the narrow path that leads to life but broad the path that leads to destruction and like it's just so such a broad path like it's so broad that there's jesus said one day many will come to me calling me lord and i'll say depart from me i never knew yeah. you. And it's, it's just so easy to um to get on the broad path you can even think you're a christian and mm. but not even care about the things of god all you care about is is worldly pleasure and you're not even but you think you're you're think you think Jesus is your Lord, but you don't mm -hmm. try to obey him at all. So, right. 
my daughter's coming in to say hi. <laughs> oh, yeah. hey, how you doing? Say <laughs> hi. Can, can you go back? So, I'm sorry. Can you go back to Mama? But no. It's about her bedtime. But <laughs> so. so, yes, it definitely sounds like uh, the friends that are around you, they're very important because they can either pull you in the right direction or the wrong direction. Right. So how do you kind of like cultivate your group of friends? How do you make sure that you're in the right circle? Uh, so one of the things I've learned recently, too, is um, the Bible says if you want friends, you should show yourself friendly. So uh, it's easy even just to go to a church and uh, not be friendly, not go out of your way to be friendly. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing lately is uh, when we find a good Christian couple at church, uh, we actually have been going out of our way to invite them over to our house or to uh, offer to go um, hang out sometime uh, as a family, and uh, that's been that's been a huge uh, life giving experience. Like it's easy to get depressed and sad when you mm -hmm. don't have any friends and or family close by, and so uh, it's been a huge. Uh, it's increased our our joy a lot just uh, reaching out being friendly to people and going out of our way personally to invite them over to our house or go inviting them out somewhere offering to bring dinner over to their house and mm. yeah. so yeah I know especially as a developer you know you get really lonely you can get isolated so you know developing that community is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, so you, you kind of said like you reached out and you know you invite them to your house um, how important is it being like proactive in maintaining these relationships? It's super important. It's like so, so important. Um, uh, I think there's like a proverb about how a foolish one isolates himself, a foolish person isolates himself. Uh, like if you're isolated, it's just so easy to get depressed and sad all the time. Uh, and uh, it's, such, it's such a good thing when you do um, – reach out and make sure at least like on a monthly basis or something uh, once or twice a month go out of your way to hang out with a, a family a christian family outside of mm -hmm. church um it's such a life-giving thing it's like it, and it's especially uh we've been able to find families that are our age with kids too and so we're able to really encourage each other and developing that has led to us We'll be texting each other throughout the week too about life and um, encouraging one another too, and so that's been such a big blessing. Yes, DJ. Like, oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, like me and Terrence, like on the show, we often talk about things like the metaverse and social media and how they kind of draw people into this like isolated world. Um, yeah. What, what do you feel like? What do What do you feel about? Uh, you know this whole thing the metaverse etc yeah uh i don't like the metaverse person <laughs> I, like, I saw this video where it was like called icelandiverse or something like that there's this guy in iceland and he's like i'm here to introduce you to icelandiverse and he's touching water he's like this is called water you can feel it with your hands in real life <laughs> not even on the screen um <laughs> so i don't know maybe i'm a funny dad old funny dad, but uh yeah <laughs> i think uh i've actually been getting away from social media a lot other than like linkedin uh, because it's a positive place and i just share positive things but i'm hardly ever on like facebook anymore personally um so i think it is uh, I, it's one of those weird things. I'm in tech, like I feel like I am helping create this world. But uh, yeah. But at the same, so it, so I have mixed feelings about it. I do think uh, it can be, it's very useful, and um, especially Christians, like we were talking about, um, are open about their faith online. It can be a great way to to spread the gospel. Like I've I've been mm -hmm. able to, to talk to people about the Lord online a lot, and um, I've been able to talk to people all over the world uh, about Christ. Like when I talk, what used to teach English um, to students, uh, 
it's, a lot of lessons would be about Christmas because Christmas is actually really big in China. Um, mm. And so it was just always a great opportunity. I was like, have you ever heard the real story of Christmas? And uh, so many Chinese students have never once heard the name of Jesus. And his name is Yesu in Chinese. And uh, so I asked, have you ever heard of Yesu? And so many, not a single time have they ever heard his name. Mm. And so I, I probably told 100 Chinese students about Jesus because of technology um, that oh, may wow. have never heard his name a single time in their life um, if it weren't for it. So I see it as a great tool for evangelism. Um, but there's also a lot of danger in it, though, too. In that right. Can, but it's like with anything, you can get addicted to, to anything, and it can ruin your life. But uh, there's also everything with moderation, I guess. Exactly. Could, yeah. So, yeah. so Yannick and Terrence, did y'all have any questions? I don't want to hog her. The um, I actually have a question about um, like the potential of um, Native Notified, but like from the industry standpoint. Um, I might have missed this earlier, but um, like, you know, tell me about the, the, well, first of all, why did you, why was this the one that stuck for you, right? Because serial entrepreneur. Yeah so, things, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is, uh, it just stuck because I was building a, an app uh, using the Expo framework, um, and I was surprised to find I could not find a push notification service uh, specifically for the Expo framework. All the services I found made you eject out of Expo, so you had to use, you had to basically come out of Expo and just use traditional React Native, vanilla React Native. Um, and I hated that. I wanted to stay in Expo. And so I just built my own service where you could stay in Expo and manage workflow. Um, and I, what got me to stick was honestly just putting it up and see a very basic product, see if I could get any paying users, specifically paying users. And I was. And so that's what got me to, okay, there's something here. I'm actually getting paying users and active users with the free plan. Um, and so it'd be worth pursuing. Um, so like with any any type of idea that pops in my head, I try not to, uh, I'll try to just create something as basic as, as I can, throw it up uh, as fast as I can, make sure it actually solves a real problem, and then start investing in some some advertising. And maybe, maybe don't even spend more than $500 on ads, $1,000 on ads. Um, to see if you can get any sales at all, like even just one. And um, if you can, then you know it's worth pursuing. If you, if nobody likes the product, nobody even signs up, nobody uses the product, then even if you love it, you just should let it die and move on. So uh, what got me to stick with this is people like the product. They genuinely love the product too. It's it's kind of special in that it's so simple to set up. Like uh, there's I come up developers are reaching out to me all the time just saying this is so simple to integrate thank you so much we've been looking so long for something and we can't figure out how to use anything but this i you can literally copy paste code and it works that's all you have to do. um so that's what got me to stick with it just it was actually having real traction yeah, on the note about developers um, reaching out and saying there's, it's so simple and, and that there's nothing out there. Uh, I don't know for sure. You're, you're the market expert. You're the subject matter expert here. So there, there isn't any major players doing this already? There so about like six to seven months after mine went live, uh, there was like one other that I know of that's like the biggest one out there that went live with their own version. Uh, but I'm not a hundred. So, so I'm starting now to get some competitors is the answer, but mine's still better <laughs> than theirs. Cause I had a head start and I've been just focused on it. Um, and whereas for them, it's not their main source of revenue. They didn't even build it in house. They hired an outside firm to build it for them. And um, so it's just, so for me, I'm, I'm talking to users, making it unique and specifically what they want, not uh, what everybody else has done. 
Um, and so that's, that's, and so anyway, yeah, that's, um, the state of it now. So, so uh, talking about competitors, uh, do you ever get a free trial of the competitors product and check it out and see what they're doing and then try to integrate their features into your products as well? Yeah. So I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I intentionally kept myself in a bubble. Uh, mm. I, uh, I didn't want any outside influence like coming between me and my users. Like I just built something I knew somebody people would want. And then I just started talking to the users asking specifically what exactly would they like me to build. And I didn't even look at it, how anybody else designed their documentation or anything like that. I just, um, that's something I'm good at personally is just, uh, having, super clear, easy, simple documentation, like a step-by-step -step process you can follow. Um, and so like, I just made it, I, it, I've intentionally been blind to how the competition does it. Cause I wanted an original product that didn't feel like I was copying everybody else. That's smart. So that's smart. But I don't know if that's the best thing to do. Maybe it's good to look at the competition, what they're doing sometimes. Uh, I don't know. I, I think I think you know. I think there's a there, there's somewhat of a of a blueprint that you can follow. But you know, there are always cases where um, you know some things that work for you might not work for the other company, right? Um, so I I do have a question, and I I, I don't I, I don't know the timeline from you know time you thought about this to, I don't know how long you've been working on this. Um, how, has it been better during COVID or has it been worse? Or did you see more traction during COVID? Did COVID impact, impact you in any way from a, from a user standpoint? So I would think it probably helps just because uh, so many businesses are, are wanting to get a presence online now because uh, they realize Oh my gosh, the government might shut down my business at any time. I should probably have a presence online in some form. Uh, but yeah, I'm not, I got started uh, almost a year ago now. So like uh, August of last year um, is when the first prod version went live. Um, and so it was kind of like a, it was still kind of in COVID, but um I, I'm not sure how much of an impact it had other than I've, I've, I heard there's like industries kind of growing a lot since COVID. Yeah, it, that, it definitely is. Um, what, um, so, so as far as the type of businesses you target, I know almost there's probably a wide variety, but maybe when you started, what were the businesses that you wanted to target more than, more than some others? So uh, that is actually a good question. So sort of this goes along with the question of why did you land here? I actually started out, I thought this would be a boring company and I didn't want to do it. Uh, I just had the idea. I told my dad about it. Um, and he, what kind of got me to decide is he came to me later and he said, you know, I was praying about that idea. I really think there could be something there. Like, I just feel like, there might be something there. You might should pursue that. Um, I was actually working on a different startup at the time, um, but I just couldn't get this out of my head. And I'm like, I know people will want this. People are going to want this because there's not a solution out there. And if I don't build it right now, there's probably going to be others are going to eventually build a solution and you could be the first one to the market. And it was just too good of an opportunity to turn down. So I just, stopped what I was working on and I went ahead, went live with this to see if I could get any customers and I was able to get some. So that's what got me to land on it. But yeah, I was built working on other things. Uh, I have an idea for, for how to create a clean internet, <laughs> like a new internet. Um, uh, that's I was building <laughs> at the time, but web 4.0. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but that would take a lot of a lot more work. I still would love to do that one day, but uh, that would probably actually take a, a real investment, a team, and everything to build. 
you know, maybe this can be like the stepping stone to towards that goal. Yeah, I'm hopeful that it is. So yeah, what uh, what what are some of the notable uh, names you've come across in the tech industry? What can you uh, ask, what do you mean? Like, uh, say for example, have you met like any prominent developers, software developers, or you know? Yeah, I've um, so in I've I've met some uh, uh, founders of companies. Um, that's been really neat to to meet some. Some founders. I've mainly met them through LinkedIn, mm -hmm. um, just reaching out, asking questions, asking for help, and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the LinkedIn is a great place to, to mm -hmm. connect with, with entrepreneurs and coders and developers. And developers. Was it kind of intimidating reaching out to them? Like, did you think like, oh, maybe they're gonna just ignore me or? That's yeah, it was. <laughs> it always is. Yeah, I feel awkward. I don't know what to say. But that's another thing as an entrepreneur, you just have to not worry about feeling awkward. And see, like, I always feel like I'm being this annoying person by reaching out to people, but I just do it anyway. And some people just don't get back to me at all. Some some do. So. <laughs> Yeah, I find out it's never as bad as you think. Like, either they ignore you or, you know, they go along with you or politely decline. It's not like they're going to curse you out or, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Worst thing they can say is no. Yeah. That's yeah, worst thing they can say. You just got to reach out. Yeah, exactly. Same with applying for a job. The worst thing they can say is no or reject you. And at that point, it's not a no. You know, it's just, yeah. they just ignore you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a link? Do you have a presence on uh, Twitter? I I don't. Not really. I have a native notified Twitter account, uh, but I don't ever use it. <laughs> I tried for a while, but I think uh, Elon Musk might be right. I think a lot of of people on there might be bots, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm basing this off my advertising efforts there. Uh, it's abnormally ineffective. <laughs> Like Twitter, mm -hmm. I've tried uh, different platforms. Twitter is abnormally not effective <laughs> at advertising, which you would think that it would be because you can specifically target people that are that like or follow certain groups and stuff. But uh, the results are really bad, like terrible. In my, they've been terrible, and so like. I've kind of just gone back to YouTube. I feel like I only have time for YouTube and a little bit on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm hardly ever on, I'm not really on Twitter anymore, honestly. So. <laughs> so, so I know you've written a couple of, you know, you've written some books and some films. What kind of books or films did you create? Yeah, so I, uh, the, I wrote two fiction books uh, and, uh, one was a, like a dystopian future. One was uh, just like a a, horror, a supernatural thriller novel, um, and uh, that's this is one of those situations where it's not good to just throw up something. Yeah. <laughs> you should probably hire an editor to make sure there's not too many uh, typos. Like you can get an editor now for like. $500 to $1,000 that'll do a decent job. But I didn't have any money at the time, so I just threw something up and it was kind of embarrassing. But the uh, the uh, other book I went out with is, was a nonfiction book. Uh, it's called Happy Are the Poor. And uh, it's just the scripture on Jesus said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit. And another, that word blessed can also mean happy. Um, and it just, talking about how you can find joy in um, living a simpler life and not of being content. Like the Bible talks about godliness with contentment is great gain. Mm -hmm. uh, I found the, the times where I was the happiest was uh, when I was content with what God gave me and, um, and thankful for what he gave me and, uh, and just focused on honestly telling people about Jesus. That's when I, Mm. just doing his his work and um, 
that's when I've found the most fulfillment in life. Uh, and I found the least fulfillment in life when I was been focused on this world, like mm -hmm. increasing and worldly right. goods and things like that, because it's like, you're never going to have enough. It's yeah. It feels like anyway, it's, it's better just be content and do everything as unto the Lord. And if you do that, you're going to be working hard and, and you're going to just naturally increase, um, at your job. If you're just disciplined, hard worker, working as unto the Lord, you're going to, they're, you're going to be getting raises or promotions and things like that. Mm. Along the way. Yeah. Some that like me and Terrence talk about a lot is like, once you start, you know, in the tech industry, your salary can jump up fast, but you don't want to just go out and spend it. You don't want your standard of living to just jump up like, cause you're going to be in yeah. that exact same spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just gonna say it's not a requirement to 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 get a flashy car. If you if you land a six figure job or you land a high five figure job, like you don't gotta go out and get a a new car and you know and all this other flashy stuff. Like it just doesn't. The two don't. You know they don't. Uh, you can have one without the other. You know, if, especially if if your car works or. If you have a whole roof over your head, there's no need to go out and get a flashy house or whatever. It just doesn't. The FOMO doesn't exist. Like you're not missing out on anything. Mm. Yeah. Besides, besides a higher bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, like that. The a lot of people don't realize it, but the Bible has a lot of advice that's not only spiritual but practical. Like uh, you chasing after all these material goods, like you mentioned, it's not going to make you any happier. You're going to get that little burst of happiness and then it's going to come back down and mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to get addicted to spending and buying to cover up what's inside. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, there, I find so many, so much practical advice in the Bible that has been so helpful in, in everyday life too. Mm -hmm. So, like, do you find any of that applies to like your coding career and how you interact with people? Yeah, it definitely does. And, uh, it, it helps me to, whenever I'm focused on uh, the right things, uh, it, everything else tends to go better. And, um, mm. so, yeah. So, so I kind of, <laughs> and I keep pounding on these business questions. I, I kind of want to come back to, um, uh, native notify, right. Um, you know, you, you're not, you're not big on social media. Um, you're also doing it by yourself. Uh, now I know there's an aspect of it where like, you know, you, you have faith and, but there's also like an aspect of it where like there, there's action, right. Um, do you think that you're doing enough at this moment? right now even even if you're trying to grind out the next feature right now you think that there could be more that you could be doing because from where i'm sitting it seems as though you're sitting on something pretty pretty awesome and um you know i i asking the hard questions here I, i'd hate to see that you know this doesn't get to its full potential um uh, because you know maybe some things that are, are obvious weren't, weren't taken care of, weren't done. Like social media, right? Social media is like a great place to just like get the word out there. Uh, you know, you, like the idea about, about getting maybe a, a junior developer or two to work on, on, on your product as, as an internship, that, that's something great. Um, that's something you can simply put out there on social media. There's a lot of, a lot of junior developers like myself that would just, um, <clears throat> jump at that opportunity. So, I mean, do you think that you, you, you could be doing more in this moment or are you just in a phase where you, you think, all right, I just need to focus on these features that I'm building and then I, I'll focus on that later. Cause you know, sometimes it's, it's important to, 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 to approach the, the problem or this, the, the, the goal that you're trying to reach from, from different angles. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really great idea that I've never thought of before, honestly, like uh, the idea of offering internships to, to developers, because there are, I could actually, I could, I have so much I want to build that I, 
I just have to, I'm trying to do what I think is the most important thing uh, next. But yeah, I, I'm going to actually be thinking about that a lot. Like I could actually, if any interns wanted to help out, um, I could definitely uh, use the help. I don't have, I couldn't pay you uh, mm -hmm. or anything like that. But um, if you wanted something on your resume, like you just got out of a coding boot camp or something like that, and you're, you want to keep something on your resume um, to be more likely to be hired, um, uh, I could I could definitely use the help. And if I ever did raise money, which I hope to raise money uh, uh, within the next six months or so, maybe if you did a good enough job, I might could hire you on full time um, one day. But that's not. But yeah, that's a. Uh, I I'm hope. I do think that is a really great idea that I actually I could get a lot more done with some help um, that and I never thought of maybe having interns help. Um, so that is a huge thing that I, I am going to be considering doing. Um, as far as social media, I, I consider kind of YouTube sort of like social media because um, I'll message back and forth in the comment section with with use, users a lot. and. Um, a lot of users, uh, I, I have my email on all the pages of Native Notify, so like I keep up with a lot of users by email too sometimes, and um, I uh, so I think I could maybe be doing more there, but uh, I'm I don't know that there's that much more I could be doing uh, based on my current knowledge. Like I know YouTube pretty well. Um, I don't know like Twitter well. Uh, I know a lot of people have success on Twitter. I know they're not all bots, but uh, like I don't, <laughs> I've never really been big on Twitter or anything, but um, that is, a, I do have a presence there and uh, I do post videos there. Um, so anyway, my, uh, I'm, I am so sorry, but I have to wrap this up. Is there like a, <laughs> One yeah. more question or something or uh no, i think okay. it's a good ending point uh we usually finish at an hour and 30 minutes uh yeah yannick uh terrence did i have anything I think no no thank you for coming on tj really appreciate thank it thank you guys so really much amazing. this was a lot of fun if, yeah uh, so if somebody wants to reach out for you to you for the uh mentoring thing how do they do that uh tj at native notify.com uh, you could just email me, and I'll get back to you. Uh, I use React on the front end, Node.js on the back end, and Postgres on as the database. So, uh, if you know any of those things, I I would love to see your your resume, what you've done, and and possibly get you on to help help out. So, awesome! I uh, will put the word out there for sure. Thank you, thank right, you so much. Thanks for showing up. You have a good. All right, job. thank you. Thanks, DJ. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.